I want to know what you're drinking. I want to know if you're having port tonight or if you're drinking a sweet fortified wine from somewhere else. I want to hear about it, maybe what varieties are in it. Tell me what you're on. Awesome, we've got Brazil back. Awesome, okay. Thank you for finding, for finding us, I appreciate it. All right, so I wanna talk about what I'm drinking and you can fill me in on what you're drinking. So tonight we'll be talking about port wine and this one is Cockburn's, this is a ruby port. It says special reserve, but in the world of port wine, their basic, sort of their basic port is ruby. And so that's what this one is. It comes in a bottle with a cap that, that's like this, with a little piece on the top of the cork. It's designed to be opened and drink, drunk over maybe a period of as long as a month. It's meant to be drunk right away. You don't have to store it. So that's what this wine is all about. Tracy, I'm hearing from Tracy. She has an SNA Doce Forte Port from Naked Wines. Oh, awesome. Wow, so Doce, is um, the this um, that is the exact same sweetness level of the wines we'll bring, be drinking tonight, so we can expect probably to taste some similar flavors there. That's really great. Yay, you found us, Lindsay! Thanks for tuning in. Sorry about that. We had some technical difficulties, and I appreciate you finding us. Repost the new link on Facebook. We are on that. Thank you for letting us know. Tracy says hers is sweet and strong. Cameron, all the way from France, I heard you're drinking uh, Dow's Port and Taylor's Port. These are some very, very classic, classic port wines. So thanks for joining in and congratulations on WSET. Way to go. That is, some, that is some hard learning that you've been going through. Thanks so much for joining in 2 a.m. all the way from France. I'm very impressed. And if you have your book with you, it's on page 164. Port wine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Phonetic says, unfortunately, I'll be drinking beer with frozen fruit in it. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so beyond this Cockburn's Ruby Port, I have a, a unique one, a pretty unique small producer from the Duro Superior called Cavedo Port. Um, this is like a family run deal, and this is their 10 year tawny. And this is what this story is all about the difference between a fresh style port and what I'd call sort of an oak aged style port wine and when I'm looking for port this is the first thing that I pay attention to because these two wines are made in two different methods and they reveal two very different tasting wines Blake hasn't received their book yet Oh, it's not there yet. That's too bad. Well, uh, page 164 talks a little bit about the different styles of port. And on page 165, you'll see uh, a talk about young port, the sort of fresh port that I'm talking about, and tawny port. And that's the oak aged port. All right. So I'm going to do a quick rundown for those of you who did find the Cockburn's port. And I want to talk a little bit about how I taste it what glass I use, what it looks like, and that sort of thing so you can get comfortable from what tasting and experiencing this wine is all about. And uh, the first thing I'd like to show you about experiencing this port wine is the glass. This is actually an official port glass. So if you can take a look here, it's a lot smaller than a regular glass of wine. And that's because the serving size of port is a lot smaller. Technically, you should probably drink about three ounces, even though sometimes it can be hard to resist just a little bit more. Another neat feature of this glass, if you look online, you can find them. Um, official Porto, I think it's Duro e Porto Garantia is what it says on the front. And it's actually the emblem of the little sticker they put on the label. You can see that looks about the same. And um, the other neat feature of this port glass is it has this cool little divot so you can put your finger in there and the, and the seal will always face outward and you keep your lips in the same spot, which I think is a very classy way to drink. Um, so this is the glass. <laughs> Sorry to go a little overboard on that, but I totally freak out about glasses. It's very exciting for me. Next, I wanna talk about 
the color and I want to show you the color. So give me a moment here. And are we on color? Great. Okay, so the color of this wine, when you look at it, we have a light under it so you can see through it at all. Because if you didn't, it would be totally opaque. Nearly totally opaque. Ruby ports are some of the darkest, boldest red wines out there. And they're made with some of the boldest, most tannic grapes you can find because of the climate in the Duro Valley. All right, I'm coming back to reality here. So when tasting this wine, the great thing about having this small, small glass is you don't, you aren't forced to really put your nose in a huge glass and you get a delivery of a very small amount of the aroma, which where is how you can develop your uh, taste profile of the wine. Now, for those of you who are sensitive smellers, I would advise you to pull your nose back and you're probably tasting with your own glass. I don't expect you to have a port glass, that's crazy. Um, but if you're tasting with a regular wine glass, I might recommend you pull your nose a little bit back because you'll be able to smell it a lot easier. You'll get, be able to pick out the aromas and the flavors a little bit easier from a greater distance and that's because of the high, high alcohol. All right, so let's give this guy a whirl. You know, right off the bat, I really get this amazing note of sort of like dried blueberries and chocolate. It's more like a sort of a bittersweet chocolate, like a baker's chocolate. And then uh, in the background, maybe a subtle note of cinnamon or true cinnamon. I don't know if you know this, but cinnamon and cassia, cassia is the one we find at like the cinnamon sticks, but true cinnamon is like really crazy. Try to get some and try it. It's, it's crazy. Um, then I get some sort of deeper sort of black raspberry. There's definitely some spice to this wine, which makes me think black raspberry over, say, black plum. As well as maybe a little bit of that sort of cooked, stewed plum, almost like a, like mm, poison sauce. That's what I'm thinking of. It has this deep sort of savory funkiness, almost like barbecue sauce, like you would get in a barbecue sauce. <laughs> Pinking out. Okay, so I think I'm saying this right. Euclides, is this look like a standard ISO glass? Am I right? Um, this is a stand, no, this is actually by Scott Zwiesel. This is a unique to port glass. They, they worked with um, Schott Zwiesel, the, the glass producer, to make a glass specifically for port. Um, if one doesn't have a port glass, would you suggest a champagne glass or a regular glass? Now that is a really interesting idea, Lindsay, because this is a lot smaller. You might be able to put a squirt in a, in a champagne glass and get away with that. I would actually use a regular glass, but you know, I just happen to have this and I wanted to share it with you. So it doesn't matter. Um, just as long as you're doing a three ounce pour. Champagne might actually be a, an interesting way to try it. I've never thought of that. That's creative, especially a tulip glass. That would be awesome. I'm getting light jammy prunes and light chocolate. Should I be picking up other things? Uh, Cameron is t tasting, are you tasting? Tell me, are you tasting the Taylors or the Dows? You know, with it, um, in my familiarity with Taylors, and I'm thinking you're drinking the Ruby Port right now, they tend to get a lot of sort of blueberry notes and uh, subtle cinnamon. I definitely get a little bit of cinnamon on that. So I might try to find that. If you can't, don't worry about it. Uh, one, a lot of the flavors I get in a Ruby style port might be like dried red chili powder. You might get star anise. Uh, orange zest sometimes. Sometimes you'll get some more of an earthy note, like a five spice powder or a, almost espresso-like flavor. Oh, you're trying the tenure tawny now? Okay, all right, I might expect a little more spice out of that. It, stick your nose in there. Oh, and maybe almost more caramel flavors from that one, just because it's aged in wood. All right, so let's, I'm just looking back through the comments to see what people are saying. So thanks everyone for joining and finding the new link. I appreciate it, that's great. Wow, so you have some port style wines 
uh, As You Like It Production says, I have some port style wines from Naked Wines. Now, this is an interesting thing before we move on to tasting, or you guys can taste it, I don't mind. Uh, the difference between port wine and port style wines, because a lot of the original port varieties came over to the United States of America and other regions around the world, and they're producing port wines with them. Now, I believe they can might still be able to call them port legally, but port is trying very hard to be like, no, port is from Portugal, this is what we call it. So who knows, it might be get uh, called like a sweet fortified red, or maybe we'll give it a new name, like porty or <laughs> something like that. Uh, but uh, I would say the difference has mostly to do with if you're drinking port from Portugal, it has the typicity of the Douro Valley, which is where it's from. Whereas if you're drinking a California one, or otherwise, or like from Australia or something like that, it'll have the typicity of that region. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. It should be made in a very similar style. So let's taste this ruby. Mm. Uh, you know, when I taste professionally, I always spit a little, but I always swallow a little too, because <laughs> I want to feel how the alcohol feels in the back of my throat. And I always do the funny sound with my mouth. And it's not because it looks cool or anything like that. It's actually kind of embarrassing. But it's because I really want to open up that the back of my palate and to get the retronasal passage, which is in the back of your nose, so I can taste the wine better. Um, there's a lot of aromas that you'll get from the back that you won't be able to taste um, just smelling from the glass. So uh, on this wine, there's a lot of acidity. Right off the bat, you get just this like ugh, hint, big hit of acidity, an explosion, more darker fruits on the flavor, black plums, uh, a little bit of spice, cinnamon spice. Uh, I, I, I feel maybe there's a little bit of like brownie, like <laughs> brownie with berry jam on it or something like that. Uh, it's a fun wine, it's sweet. Uh, this wine in particular has about 103 grams per liter of residual sugar. If I was to equate that to like teaspoons per glass, uh, maybe in this glass, oh, there might be about four or four teaspoons of sugar in this, which is, I mean, there's not very much fluid in here, so it's pretty sweet. Uh, if you compare it to Coke, there we go. I can compare it to Coke. Coke has 113 grams per liter of residual sugar, and this has a little bit less. So as much as this tastes super duper sweet and crazy, it's not as sweet as Coke. Fun fact, not as sweet as Coke. Delicious port wine. All right. Is port paired best with dessert or drink it with other food? Great question, Tim. M uh, there is one food that goes amazing with port and it's cheese. It is the perfect thing and in fact, one of my favorite perfect pairings in the world is a glass of ruby with some Stilton cheese. And you know, you're thinking a perfect pairing, a Stilton cheese and sweet port, that seems kind of crazy. But when you put the two together, you create a new flavor and it's amazing. I highly recommend it. I'm sorry I didn't put it in the notes. I should have done that. That would have been awesome. Everyone tasting the port and Stilton pairing. Uh, if you keep the bottle around for a couple of days, definitely pick up some cheese and try it out. It's amazing. Um, but as far as other desserts, chocolate. This, you know, people always talk about wines that go with chocolate. This is the chocolate wine right here. You got it. You got it in your hand. Go make a brownie and taste it together and it's amazing. All right. So that sugar comes from the grapes, right? Not added sugar? Tracy, great question. Yes, the sugar comes from the grapes and here's how it works. So when you're making port wine, you get all the berries together into this big square container and then you stomp around in it for a few days. Over the period of a few days of stomping, well, it's like two days of stomping the grapes, it oxidizes a little bit and it starts to ferment. It's a natural fermentation. All the best port producers use natural fermentation to do this. And then when it reaches a point where it has the sugar level that they're desiring, in this case, the doce, 
which is about 89 to 120 grams per liter of residual sugar, they will immediately remove it from the tanks and then add brandy to it. And that's why it's called fortified wine. And now this brandy isn't your typical normal brown colored brandy. It's totally clear and it's very, very flavorless. Now, when I talked to uh, the, the Porto uh, Garantia, uh, the Vino de Porto board, they described uh, that most producers are using a grape brandy may, may be made from other grapes in the region or from Chenin Blanc from South Africa. That's basically neutral grape spirit. And they'll add up to about 30% of the fluid is this, is this neutral grape spirit. And so then what happens is it completely kills the fermentation from happening. No more yeast can survive in such a high alcohol environment and they'll let the wine settle and then you have this beautifully sweet from the natural sugar port wine. Now to make tawny port, if I can just segue into tasting my tawny next, you do the same thing, but then you leave it in oak barrels. So, and I'm not talking like regular old Pinot Noir oak barrels. Some of these oak barrels are gigantic. They're huge. They'll contain something like 20,000 gallons or liters of wine in them. And then they also have smaller oak barrels and the reason why they have a sort of a combination of both is the big ones just kind of hold the wine and slowly oxidize it through the wood and the little ones actually impart the flavor. So those flavors of vanilla that you might get and hazelnut and these are all the sort of nutty flavors that you'll get from oak aging and find them specifically in a tawny port. All right, so Madeline. I'm just looking at the book. This is As You Like It Productions. I'm just looking at the book and you detail Tawny, but not Ruby. Is Ruby what you detail as, is what you detail as young port? In the book, it says Ruby. Okay, it says this youthful style of port wine that's aged for a short time and designed to be drunk immediately. Wines tend to have more spice notes and tannin. So I would say Ruby is a young port. And then Tawny, there are various age classifications of tawny port. <laughs> I see you guys figured it out. <laughs> okay, and then tawny port, on the other hand, you have different classifications of tawny. If it is a 10 year tawny, that means the minimum age of all the wine that goes into this is at least 10 years old. Now, if you have a 20 year tawny, same thing happens. 40 year tawny, same thing, you get the idea. There's another kind of tawny that's kind of special if you get a chance to try it, and it's called a colleta. A colleta is a tawny port that they only get from one vintage. So they make the port wine just like Ruby, and they put it in the, in the barrels, but they keep it separate from the other ports because they think maybe it's a special vintage, they really wanna see how it produces on its own. So you can, out there, pick up a bottle of say like 1980 Coyeta or 1983 Coyeta Tawny Porto and it's really a magical experience. These wines will, you know, that would be like a 30 year uh, Tawny Port and you'll get to experience a single vintage uh, which is pretty special because most port wine is blended. Not only is it a blend of grapes but it's also often a blend of vintages. Okay, so Let's talk about the difference between uh, Tawny Macbeth. I love your last name. Actually, your whole name put together is really beautiful. Tawny, and you're drinking Tawny? Tawny Macbeth wants to know what LBV is. Late bottled vintage port, in my opinion, is one of the best values in the business. And here's why. What makes it, it's a single vintage port, just like vintage port wine, but it sits around in barrels a little bit longer, or tanks a little bit longer. So it sort of takes on some characteristics, almost like a tawny wood, but only maybe up to like five, five years or so. So it's not, it's, you'll see it's not super nutty. Um, but it, then it's released on the market like a vintage port and often has a cork like this one actually has a cork like this. Uh, it's meant, the, which means you can cellar it. You can continue to cellar this wine. It has a cellar worthy cork. Uh, so a uh, late bottle vintage is a great, great value to basically taste a vintage port that's had just a little bit longer in the cellar before it's released. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something that the, the community at, in port 
did to sort of have a distinction somewhere in between a ruby and a vintage because they basically had these all these wonderful wines that were getting declassified into ruby and they're like oh, I really don't want to blend this with my other stuff it's a good wine um, and that's where the ruby uh, late bottle vintage came from I paid $37.99 for my 10-year tawny in the DC area well I bet it's delicious is that did you find the uh, Renzo Cuadros did you find the um, the Quevedo um, this is a good wine okay so moving on to this Quevedo port this is a tawny it's 10 years tawny um, as the wines spend more time, 10 years I would say is sort of your beginner level tawny, but as it spends more time in the quinta, in the winery, it takes on more and more nutty and vanilla flavors. So we're basically getting the beginning of that flavor curve that I want to talk about with aged tawnies. And I'll give this a quick tasting and we'll see how we do. Lorenzo went with Smith Woodhouse. That is an excellent wine. Uh, Renzo, is that that you have a ten-year tiny from Smith Woodhouse? Um, it, if you're giving it a sniff, smelling it right now, and comparing it to a ruby, you'll you'll notice right away how much this wine has changed, and. Immediately in the nose, I start to get caramel, I start to get more cinnamon, and I get a lot less fruit. I'm starting to smell things like figs and dates, and I'm smelling less of those black fruits, that plum, that black raspberry that I was getting in the ruby port. <sighs> I'm going to have to get me, Tracy says, I'm going to have to get me some of that there, Tani. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so I want to show you what this port wine looks like. All right, let's take a look in the wine cam, <laughs> the wine color cam. If you can think back to when we saw the first port wine, this is way different looking. It looks more ruddy orange. It's a lot more pale in color. You can see there's a lot more rim variation from the B center of the wine all the way to the edge. It gets sort of this light yellow color. This wine is experiencing oak aging and as wines sit in oak longer they lose their color. They become a little lighter and they also oxidize a bit and that's where you get that orange, that nice orange rim. Um, oxidation in wines like these is not a big deal. It's actually a benefit. And that's because it adds all those amazing nutty flavors you get in wine. So sometimes oxidation, when it's used right, can be quite wonderful in a wine. All right, Abby and John says they have the Smith Woodhouse also. And they say the palate is much, much softer than the nose. Trying to hold it far from my face. Lindsay's trying to hold it as far as from her face as she can, she's getting caramel. And orange, I agree. I get more orange, Ryan. And it's weird. It's almost, it's odd. It's almost like hibiscus. Very subtle. Ah, you know, this is this spice characteristic I'm talking about always. Almost like chili pepper. I always get this um, sort of funky chili pepper nose. Tons of cinnamon. Toffee, caramel. Much, much lighter in the style. And then on the palate. It's like figs, dates, and cinnamon. Okay. Here's a fast fact about this wine and tawny ports in general. They sit in a barrel and Lindsay says she's drinking liquid bl blueberries. I think that's awesome. So Tawny ports sit in a barrel and they oxidize over time. And when that happens, they evaporate a little bit. So over time, you'll see really old tawnies tend to have higher alcohol and they will also have higher sugar levels because the, the, the fluid is the water that's evaporating out of this wine. And you're left, well actually that alcohol evaporates too a little bit. And the wines become a little bit more intense, a little bit sweeter and more intense. And this wine is actually only a few grams per liter more of uh, 
Residual sugar, I think it was something like 108. So technically this is about as much as a Coca-Cola. And it tastes pretty sweet. It tastes remarkably sweeter uh, than this Cockburn's port over here. This is the Tawny. And one of the reasons for that is over time, the wine also might lose a little acidity and a little bit of that tannin. And those things act as sort of buffers for our ability to taste sweetness in things. So when you have a very high tannin wine with sweetness, you don't taste the sweetness as much as if you had a lower tannin or a lower acidity wine. So I would suspect, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure at this moment what the acidity is, but I would suspect that it might have slightly less acidity as well. Yeah, the Porto, the Cupcake Fine Tawny Port is, is nice. And if it's a fine tawny port, that is, as much as fine sounds wonderful, that's going to be their basic tawny. And those have a minimum aging requirement, I think, of about seven years. So it's very, very close to the 10-year tawny port. So that's actually, that Cobke is quite a nice wine to taste um, and a great value, a wonderful value. All right, so Cameron Price, you've got to remind us. You said that yours tastes like figs and dates and cinnamon. Which one are you drinking now? Mm-hmm. That wine's delicious. Okay, so I want to know if you have any questions about port or which we should pair with this wine and that kind of a thing. So uh, while, we're, while we're thinking about any questions you might have, I might uh, talk about what I might pair this with. Um, because Tanis take on less fruit flavors and they get a little lighter and more caramely, I tend to steer a little bit farther away from chocolate, straight chocolate. And I might do like chocolate peanut butter, like a Reese's peanut butter cup, or maybe I'll look into sort of more of a caramely chocolate thing or something with a little more caramel in it in general, a pie, that kind of a thing. Um, because I won't have that intensity of the tannin and the berries to sort of support those cocoa flavors that you get in chocolate. So I would lean a little bit farther away from straight chocolate with a tawny, whereas ruby port, I would run towards <laughs> straight chocolate. But um, one of my favorite pairings with this wine is uh, peanut butter cup. It's pretty simple. Okay, Tracy Davis wants to know about late bottled vintage port. How long would that be aged to be considered late bottled? I think technically they must be aged uh, four, four to I think it's four to five years, and it's actually bottled usually, so it won't spend too much time in oak. It usually, so what happens is um, there's a there's a process of in order to become a vintage port, you have to send it to the port board, and they have to approve it, and it's a three year process basically. You, go, you send it in, and if it doesn't get approved in that three year process, it continues to age. There's nothing you can do about it, and when if it doesn't make it within those three years to become labeled vintage port, it goes into a second, like from four to six years, it can be labeled as a late bottled vintage port. This is very like technical and silly, and, but it basically means like if you don't miss the first bus, you can take the second bus <laughs> and still be considered a vintage port. And so that's sort of how late bottled vintage port came about. In Portugal, do they have regulatory agencies such as AOC or DOCG? Lindsay, great question. Yes, uh, the uh, Vinos de Porto is the guaranteed guarantee board for guaranteeing port wine, and it's actually one of the oldest in the world. It's older than France. It's older than Italy. Uh, and the only one that I think is older is uh, Hungary for Tokai wine, which is another sweet wine. Um, but I think it was first ratified and created in like 1730s, somewhere around there, it's real old. And so it was the first official classification system for port wine. And it was because uh, the port wines were being created then, this is the time of the era of exploration and they were shipping a lot of port to England and they kind of wanted to make a regulatory board to sort of control port wine and so nobody would else would take the rules and the regulations and they wanted to make it consistent, that was the goal. Okay, so As You Like It Production has a doce, forte, forte means fortified, doce means sweet, same sweetness level as the two wines we're drinking, 
uh, 89 to 120 grams per liter. And then the first one tasted dark chocolate, lime cheesecake, graham cracker. Sounds weird, but that's what I tasted. You've got a good palate as you like your productions. I really like your style. Cheesecake, lime cheesecake. Um, oh, you tried it with a bit of dark chocolate and lime cheesecake. Dark chocolate, lime cheesecake. All right, graham cracker and uh, port wine does sound like a pairing that I would definitely go for. I imagine the cheesecake was probably pretty amazing too. I'm worried about the lime, but I'm on board with that. I would try it. All right. I, uh, Trent, Trent Combs, thanks for texting. I think, I think I haven't seen you right yet. I have a Churchill's Dry White and a Reserve. How do they compare? So you have the Dry White from Churchill's and the Reserve Wine from Tur Churchill's. And these wines, I believe, are their dry style wines made with port grape varieties. So what's, here's what's cool and what's going on in Porto and in that whole region in the Douro. Not, in case you didn't notice, these things are extremely good value. You can pick up an amazing bottle of port wine for very, very cheap. And these Porto producers have been making this wine for hundreds of years and it's amazing. Um, for some reason, the market is afraid of sugar and we're afraid of these wines and they've sort of fallen out of fashion. So, the port producers are starting to experience, experiment and produce dry wines to fit with the marketplace. And Churchill's is one of these people who's taking, going, here's my port grapes. I'm going to start trying to make dry wines with them and see how they come out. And just like there is a red port, porto, or port wine, there's also a white port wine made with the regional white grapes um, of the Douro Valley. So you're tasting the dry version of what, what would get made to traditionally into port wine. So you're basically getting the straight up here's what these grapes turned into wine actually taste like. And if you can leave your tasting notes, uh, a couple of messages about how it tastes, how, the dryness, the acidity level or something like that, I'd love to hear it. Uh, that would be fun for us to compare how, say, this, you know, this ruby uh, porto, port over here sort of is actually, could be a dry wine in some manner or form. If you don't may add fortification to it and you keep it fermenting, it'll make a dry wine. Uh, so that's a really fascinating thing that's going on. And if you are curious and you like dry red wines, I would highly recommend looking into the grape variety Toriga Nacional. That's on um, page, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, if you go to page uh, 156 in the Wine Folly book, this is just one of the grape varieties they use in Port in uh, Duro, and they have several others. Uh, Torriga Nacional, Torriga Franca is very popular, uh, Tinto Rouge, which is, uh, is actually Tempranillo, and uh, these grapes make absolutely fabulous dry wines. Um, I kind of equate Torriga Nacional to sort of a, a sort of a rich sort of a cross between Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah. Like it has all the tannin and length of Cabernet, but it has the rich, bold, plummy, sort of violety flavors of um, Syrah. So it's a pretty fascinating wine. Um, Euclidus, you've got good tastes. I love Torrega Nacional as well. I'm a very big fan of that. All right. So any other questions tonight about these wines? And thanks so much for finding us again. Just, um, I want to say a couple of last words before I see your last words. And uh, it would be, have a happy holiday. It's been a pleasure. This is the last night we're in the office. And uh, then we're going to take a couple days off and come back <laughs> and do it again. So it's really fun to close down the evening with you guys. And I hope you're warm and cozy. Or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, hot and toasty <laughs> down there. I appreciate you joining us. All right, so cheers, everyone. Uh, I uh, hope you drink a little more port wine over the holidays. Mmm. Delicious. <laughs>